you should have all heard from your PM by now. Uh, if you haven't or having trouble, uh, let me know. Um, a few people have asked for extensions on uh, the whatever it's called, like the the one grade scope assignment that has to do with the backlog and stuff. Um, that's totally fine. However, if you sent me an email directly, it is likely that I missed it or forgot it or got sidetracked or whatever. So please, if I haven't responded, uh, please post on Piazza private to uh, instructors and somebody will catch it that way uh, rather than me uh, who I get too much email. Uh, make sense? So look, it's okay to ask for an extension for this if you haven't met with the client uh, you know, and it's scheduled or whatever. So ask for an extension, tell us when you think you'll be able to get it done by. Uh, and then we can uh, make sure you have enough time. Um, the ethics assessment for your project is also released. It had a bug in the like grade scope thing where one of the questions didn't have like a text field to type into. Uh, that's fixed now. So if you have already taken a look at it or whatever, um, just keep in mind there's a new one. Like the question was there, it just didn't have any place to put an answer. Um, we're probably, I mean, I know we were going to do have a like a little workshop uh, exercise uh, based on Git uh, after this lecture. I'm not sure it's not quite ready yet. So hopefully we'll have it out by end of day. Um, it, if it takes you an hour, I would be shocked. OK, so it should be very quick. It's just to kind of make sure that you took away the important bits of this uh, presentation. Um, and so we have a guest lecturer today, uh, Anish, and I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Asana? Yeah, good enough, Asana. Okay, all right. Um, former colleague at Red Hat, um, and he's been doing this presentation a, but, a bunch about Git. I also like to give you some different perspectives than necessarily always my own. Um, and so hopefully uh, he will be able to deliver this better than I can, especially seeing as my Git skills are scary. Um, so, there you go. Questions. All right. Cool. All right. Yeah. So before I start, oh, what? everything broke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It's really easy. If you step on the HDMI cable, it will pop out. Um, so hold on. So just be careful not to step on the wire because that end is loose. Oh, great. Yeah, it makes it more fun. <laughs> hey, great. Yeah, so before I start, like we also have Parishad here. Um, he did most of the actual work on the workshop. I just, I like talking, so I'm here to present on stuff. Um, yeah, so like Langdon said, my name's Anisha Stana. Um, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat doing many things which are out of scope for this class. And uh, today we'll be talking um, about version control generally, but mostly focused on Git since that's what is popular nowadays and it's probably easiest to use. So um, why should we care about Git, right? Or version control. Um, how many people here have seen Toy Story 2? Okay, great, I'm not old yet. <laughs> um, why are we, like this is a pretty common story, but like um, while they were working on it in back in like 1990s, something or the other, um, one of the animators working on it accidentally started deleting the whole movie. Um, he screwed up a command he ran and like, the movie is, you know, like file by file is getting deleted. Um, they got it, managed to save 10% of the movie, which is nothing. Um, so they were kind of screwed. Um, they were expecting to, you know, not have a movie to ship. Luckily, one of the people on the team was working from home due to some illnesses and she had a copy of the movie, which is a few weeks old in her social system. Um, that's the only copy remaining of the movie. They had backups, even the backups weren't working, which you know says something about disaster recovery. I don't know if you guys are really doing that stuff. Um, and yeah, here's a fun little comic, but so technically version control is sort of built to address some of these things. Um, typically it's just a tool to store files. You can have a central server, it can be a distributed system, it can be managed by a dedicated team, you know, there's many ways to do it. Um, it's used to track changes to files as they happen, right? So any changes, timestamps when changes were made, who made them, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
in addition to disaster recovery, I think another very important aspect of ocean control of GIT is that most projects in industry, sometimes in academia, are worked on by more than one person, right? You have to collaborate with people. And Git makes it much easier for you to work together. Um, back when I was in college, I didn't know much about Git. So most of my projects would end up looking like V1, V2, V final, V final, final, you know, and like you just go like that. Obviously not scalable. Um, it's also hard to back things up when you, you know, screw something up or you don't know why you made a change and things broke. Now there's different kinds of version control. First version is no version control, the Toy Story model. You're working, you're working, your laptop crashes or falls in some water, it's cool. You have nothing left to do. The second kind of version control system is, you know, using managing your own. Right? So you have your own machines, you're running your own servers for Git or Mercurial, which is just a competitor, I guess, of an alternative. Um, you, you typically have dedicated teams, you have multiple servers for your Git. Um, so even if one of your machines goes down, you have other servers, you you have something left for you. The last most common kind is something based online, right? This is where your GitHub or your GitLab or you know what have you come in. Um, these are the easiest to use because these companies make that's their job, right? Um, and most of them are free to use and open source and all that fun stuff. So um this is a question after the poll, which I don't have Flickr or anything, but um does anyone here know how you maintain security in large projects? Actually, I'm gonna take a step back for the question. Um what level is the last language? Like a professor one? white. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, five nineteen. So five hundred master seniors. Okay, master seniors, okay. Um are how many people here are familiar with Git? I had used anyway. All right, cool. That's usually where I start with that on the robot. Um, yeah. Um, anyone have any ideas on this? Yeah, um, good question. So in, in general, you end up using both. And um, the way I look at it is like we use SSH for authorization. authorization. So basically you connect to GitHub and do pull it, pull it and all of that stuff. And you usually end up using GPG to sign your commits. So basically you improve your identity, right? So if you make some changes and you sign them with your GPG key, um, people will know it was done by you and not by someone else saying that they're you. Because um, as you use Git, you find that it's actually very easy to change the email address and the name and all that information that's associated with the commit. So like GPT sort of provides a safeguard around that or against that. So, um, so of this presentation, I'll be going over a lot of the basic terminology you need to know. Um, if I'm spending too much time, just you know, maybe I can speed through things a bit faster. Um, the first basic term you care about is repository or repo for short. Um, it's just a collection of files. You can think of it almost like folders. Most people like to scope the repos to projects or just to products. Um, some companies like Google go crazy and they have just like one massive repo which contains everything. Up to you how you want to do it, right? Like it's absolutely your choice. Um, all the files are just like normal files. You have your timestamps, permissions, and all that stuff. So here, are, um, this is a diagram we're going to keep coming back to. Um, yes, okay. So um, up top, you have a server. We're going to be using GitHub for this. Um, there's three repos on here alpha, beta, and gamma. And the client machine is my own machine, um, which is going to connect to stuff. Right now, this is not on my machine. Um, the second important term you need to care about, um, git clo clone or checkout. This is basically you downloading files for the repository for the first time. Um, it gives you a local copy to work with. And I think the best part about it is that any changes you make on your local copy do not get sent online. 
So you can feel free to do whatever you really want and like not worry about messing up things for other people. So in here, someone just trying to get cloned, just send that HTTPS to the next stage. Um, and you just get a copy of the current state of the repo as well as the history of all the changes that have happened over time. Um, the next command is pull update um, in simple terms. Um, and this is basically a way for you to get all the updates that have happened on nine, which are not on your local system. The thing you get is like by default, it's not going to automatically update every time something happens up like on nine. So you have to manually tell it, hey, I want to pull in changes from upstream, upstream technology. And also, yeah. So here you can see that someone made some changes to these two files and it's not in our system. We're going to run git pull and now we have all the changes that happen online on our system. So we have the same state. Um, now commit is something I said a couple of times and you can effectively think of it as saving it. Um, as you work through your projects, anything you're working on, you'll be making changes to files and you'll be saving them and um, Git will track these changes as they happen, but it won't um, make a checkpoint or a commit as such. Um, a commit is basically you're going to get, okay, I want you to look at all these files that have changed and like commit it to memory. I don't know if I way to put in that. Um, this usually contains, you know, author, timestamp and message. Um, Git commit messages are very important. We won't be talking about them much, but you should make sure to write good Git commit messages so that um, whenever, whenever you're looking at again the past or the future, you know what you were thinking. So in this case, you know, I've made some changes to a file. Um, I first add it that I'll get, okay, I want to track these changes, and then I commit using command, basic syntax. Important thing to note, I've committed it to my local copy and it does not go online to the server. Pushing is how you, it's the opposite of pull, right? So I made changes on my system, I wanna push it up, up to the server, I'll just run get push. So now I've made multiple changes, I just push it up. All files look the same, not everyone. We're happy. Um, yeah, good question. So, which one of these commands can you run to create a copy of a repository? Clone, pull, fetch, checkout. Oh, oh yeah, great. Yes, that is correct. You can always go second there. <laughs> so now we're going to go for workflow. Um, I'm working on my copy. At some point, I should delete a file. Fix that. Um, but you know, the rest of my team is working. They've uploaded changes to the server. Um, I'll add some files. I'll change it. I'll commit it, and I'll try pushing. What's going to happen is Git will stop you from from pushing immediately. Um, it'll say, "Hey, there's changes online that you have not accounted for. They're not part of your changes." So what you're going to end up doing is first pulling the changes, resolving any conflicts that happen. So if someone change files that you're also working on. Sometimes you can get what is called a mode conflict, which you work through in your workshop. And then you know, resolve the changes. After that, it's clean again. So you can push it up and it works. So next thing to uh, we'll cover is the tag. Um, it's a Maybe I should release a text on them. But it's effectively just a snapshot of the repo at any given point of time. Um, so earlier when I was giving an example of, you know, like I used to have projects like V1, V2, V final, you can think of those almost as tags. Um, usually people use them to mark releases or before you're um, making major changes to your project. So in your very simplified version numbers, right? This is not actually what version numbers are, you know, changes happen and like these files have changed. And we decided to create like, you know, like, hey, our project is now at like V1, V1 ready, right? So we call it a release, we create a tag. And from that point onwards, Git will know that if you want to refer to a specific tag, this is what the files will look like. 
changes will continue happening in the repo and they will not affect any persistent value. Like I said, so you can have multiple tags, you can create, create as many tags as you want. So branching. Um, you can think of a branch as a parallel line of development in your repository. Um, this way, any changes that are made in one branch will not carry over to other branches, right? So this gives you an additional level of protection between you know, changes getting mucked about. You can merge and create branches as you want. And usually you use them to work on you know, any features you want to do, right? You don't want to commit directly to the main development branch. You should always be creating your separate branches to work on any features or whatever. whatever. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is like the main branch. Um, every team, every company has their own terminology for using, but um, in general, you can think of it as main, head, or trunk. Um, old terminology for it was also like referred to as the master branch, but there's been a shift away from that. Um, you can think of it as the primary branch in a given repo. Um, and generally speaking, you will never push or commit directly to that branch um, unless something pops up. So here, you know, you have your main branch continuing on normally, you create a branch, development continues normally in parallel. Some things happen there, some things don't happen here. And afterwards, we merge the changes from this branch into this. Um, I know there's a lot of slides, once you're doing the actual workshop, this will hopefully make a lot more sense. So, when you look on the primary branch, um, anytime you clone the repo, um, it's called to pull down the, the main branch at that point of time. So, um, yeah, just anything on any cloning. I um, mean, have multiple branches for different releases, so sometimes people get tripped up on that. You can also use um, Git to check out tags at a specific point of time. So even though previously I had, you know, whatever was on main, once they're on Git checkout, I'll get the files as they looked at this point of time. We've been talking about Git the whole time, but let's talk a little bit more specifically on what Git is. Um, it's a distributed version control system, um, as opposed to a centralized system like SVN, where I'm not actually quite sure how SVN works, but I know it's just a central system that you somehow work and download changes from. Maybe you know. Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in some ways, actually, SVN does some things nicer than Git, uh, but it, the whole concept is a central repository versus Git, which is distributed repository. So every every clone of a Git repo is a server, um, and you know, and so they're all equal. So they fight out the which one is the is current. Uh, whereas subversion, there's a concept of this is the right one, this is the golden one, um, which has the big disadvantage of going back to your everything's on fire question. If that server lights on fire, you're in a lot of trouble. And most modern companies don't use it nowadays, so there are some very you, still, you still see subversion and CDS, which is the granddaddy of them all, yeah. um, in old open source projects, typically. Um, but most of them have migrated to Git. Because one of the things that I would point out here is who here knows who wrote Git? Yeah, who's that? You know, who is it that that person that you just named is? Oh, uh, there's also the guy who wrote the Linux. Yeah. So uh, he, he got annoyed with the fact that somebody took the uh the version control system he was currently using and made it cost money so he decided to write a new one and took like a month or two off and wrote git uh and basically took over the world for source control it's crazy yeah. <laughs> um yeah and with git and presumably with some version grant support is pretty it's, it's easy right you can create branches for effectively free um, the versions are previously we mentioned, you know, v1, v2. That's not actually the case. We use SHA1 hashes to um, track the state of the repo. Um, Git is really, really easy to screw up. 
um, especially when you're learning. Um, and I had a cop an ex a comic uh, an XKCD right at the beginning, right? Where if you screw it up, right? I've definitely done this before. I just make a copy of the files, delete the repo, and I copy the files back in because sometimes you can end up in really weird situations. Um, so don't feel bad if you something terrible happens. Part of the process. Um, we talked about Git and now there's GitHub, um, the tree, which is I think the most important part about it. Um, it's very commonly used by a lot, lot of open source projects. Again, like Naiman mm -hmm. said, there are some older ones which are not on GitHub. I think the kernel, for example, is that right? No, on there's, GitHub? Yeah, no. yeah, it's on its own thing. So, but it's on Git. It's yes, it, it's on Git, but not GitHub. Um, but you know, a lot of very common projects today are on GitHub, so it's easy to find places to contribute to and like do fun stuff. And um, one thing I really like about GitHub is that any code you write in there, um, it's open source, right? So anyone can look at it. Um, so you can have it on your resume and you can say, hey, you know, like I, I worked on this project, it's up here on GitHub and someone who's looking at it, who's actually gonna interview you or whatever, can look at it. Um, not to say that always happens, but I tend to like, look at people's GitHubs. Yeah, so uh, two comments. Uh, I, since basically GitHub has started to be around, I have never hired anyone without looking at their GitHub profile. Uh, I've been doing it for faculty searches here. Like it is that much of a part of your resume now. Uh, the other thing is just to clarify one of the things you said, it is free as in cost, but GitHub has large amounts of proprietary software that is not open source. Um, they, a lot of open source projects are there because it's free, but not because GitHub is open source. GitLab, its major competitor, which will not support your resume quality as highly, um, but it's just as good a product, is actually open source. On that note, like I actually prefer using GitLab, but then this, this is not a big community, so I... Yeah, it's, it's gotten a lot bigger since Microsoft acquired GitHub, yeah. uh, because there are a lot of open source projects that hated Microsoft on principle, and so they moved to GitLab, um, but there it is. There it is, yeah. <laughs> If you had to have one account, I'd say use GitHub. Um, you know, it supports organizations and anything you know you may want to do for a project. Obviously, all basic stuff. Um, as of last when I updated these slides, uh, there's over 119 million repositories on it. I'm sure a lot of those repos are actually junk, like you know, hello world kind of things, but. <laughs> Or Langdon's code, but uh, <laughs> most of my repos. Okay. But yeah. So um, here is a common term, right? That we use all the time when you're working um, in any Git situation. Uh, it's called a fork. Um, it's really just a copy of a repository that belongs to someone else. So that, like Langdon was saying earlier, well, not quite like that, but like. Um, most people's Git workflows involve creating forks of actual like, projects, and then you work in your own fork and you make pull requests back to like where you forked from. Um, I mentioned very, you know, you can all work in one repo if you want to. It's really, really up to you. Um, the nice thing about forks is that changes only go into your portion of the repo. Um, so especially for large projects, if everyone is pushing up on branches into the same repo, it can get a a little, a lot, clunky. So having separate forks that lets you sort of, you know, keep everyone else's stuff outside of your stuff. Um, building on fork, we have something called pull requests. Um, in GitLab, they refer to as merge requests. Same thing. Idea is I've got commits in my version, in my fork of your repository, and I say, hey, I think this is really good. You should take it, right? So you can raise a pull request. And it basically sends a chain set to the person who um, owns the upstream repository. Um, they can comment on the code you've submitted, right? So they review your code. You make changes to your pull request, you address the comments, you go back and forth a few times, and hopefully they eventually merge it. Um, there'll also be situations where they straight up reject your PR pull request because it was it doesn't align with what the project wants. Any questions on any of that?
right, so say right now um, we have two users on GitHub, ASL, like it's me, and then HNL, which is Harsha. Um, he has a repo called Gamma, which I don't have under my user on GitHub. And I keep saying GitHub, right? But like this applies in any kind of Linux workflow. Um, I create a fork to the GitHub UI and it creates a copy of his repository under my username. I then, you know, work will continue on in the original repository and it will not affect anything in my copy of it or my fork. I will then run git clone and it will pull in my fork, right? But I can also put his fork directly, but it doesn't matter. So I've clone my repo. I make changes to my local machine. I commit them, I push it up to my fork. And then I raise a pull request again. They do it through the GitHub UI. Um, they recently came out with a CLI called GH, um, which also lets you do it directly from the command line. Um, I actually prefer using that now, um, just a little faster than using the UI. Um, really up to you uh, how you want to do things. I see a lot of math here, so you probably all have terminals. Now, like I said, right, so if Harshad accepts my pull request, the commits will be given, like merged into the original repository. Um, I have not covered the answer to this so far, but um, does anyone have any guesses on how you could check the state of the repository? A um, couple of different commands, git status, git diff, git check, git log. Um, at least three of these commands are actual commands. I'm not sure if git check is an actual a command. I'm, I think I made, made that one up. <laughs> but um, yeah, status like lets you see what, what's going on. Git diff lets you see um, the changes that are, the specific changes that have happened in files. And git log lets you see all the commits that have um, been created in the repo. So you can look at the messages and the timestamps and figure out who made them so you can go yell at them. Usually ends up being me, but yeah. Now of course, some of our important commands. Like I said, git log um, lets you the commit history for your branch up to that point of time. Um, <coughs> this is something I find myself using a lot. Um, as you're working and making changes on your project, sometimes you find that things stop working or something changed that you weren't expecting to change. Um, going through the commit history will let you figure out what's going on. <coughs> Git remote is something you use when you are working with forks. So um, in the example from earlier, we had the copy which was under Harshad's username and we had a copy under my username. Um, with Git remote, I can say, okay, I wanna add a reference to his username and um, in case I wanna pull changes in from his uh, repository directly. Um, a lot of hand waving going on right now as you walk through the workshop. All of this will hopefully make more sense. Git rebase. Um, this is what breaks many, many people <laughs> when they're working. Um, it's also, I think, the command I use most often uh, when I'm doing things. Um, what it does is that it takes the commits from the branch you have targeted and puts your commits on top of them, but within your own branch. So to go through a con more concrete example, um, say I check out my own branch called Awesome Feature. I make changes and I commit them. I'll then fetch upstream. So basically um, pull the changes that are in Harsh's um, repository into my local system, but not into my specific branch. I'll then run git rebase upstream slash main. And um, what that does is it okay, puts my commits on top of all the commits that came from Harshad's repo. Um, it makes it easy for you to keep your history clean though, um, which again, very important when you're working in large projects. Um, finally, you'll end up pushing to your own fork and then you raise the PR. Um, in addition to you know, this, with rebasing, you can also squash commits, which is basically merging multiple commits into one commit. We can edit commits, which is you know, change an existing commit. You can just drop commits all together, which is deleting them. And there's, there's a couple more, which, you know, as you run them, you, you'll see in reward commit messages and all that stuff. 
uh, on the hosted services. We talked a little bit about it. There's GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. I haven't used that. I looked at any of those actually. <laughs> um, was Bitbucket a uh, subversion? Uh, yes, I, I think. I feel like it was. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I'm it probably might, past it. Bizarre. Huh? It might be bizarre. Actually, can you go back for a second? Uh, yeah. Just, I want to make a comment on get, on squash. Um, so part of why we're doing this talk, assuming that you have some familiar with Git already, right, is to kind of show you a little bit about like how it's used in the real world, like if by professional versus like whatever you hack together when you had to do it for a class or something. Um, so many many projects. Uh, it, expect you to squash your commits into a single commit before submitting it for a PR. So what you normally do with most projects, and this is, it's really important that you do this, especially if it's like a big open source project, so you kind of go and read the, you know, how to interact with us as developer thing, and it'll usually have Git instructions. But one of them is basically, when you're ready, when you think it's done, you do a git rebase against whatever current tip is on the tree and the code, and which will basically say, okay, reincorporate everything else. You will likely have changes that you need to fix for, right? Because now you've rebased your code on top of a new set of code. So you make some more changes, make some more commits to do that or whatever. Then you, what you do is you often will squash the commit. And what you do to not make that a lossy activity is usually you keep a lot of your commit statements there, but you squash it all into one commit so that when you when you send a PR, right? So when you send the, the pull request, the receiver only sees one commit, right? And why is this? Because it's easier for them to then think about whether they want to merge it or not, because they'll see the feature as a whole, right? But it is strongly recommended that you commit kind of as early and often as possible, and then deal with the fact that you need it to be one commit at the end with a squash. Does that make sense? Be careful though, because both squashing, rebasing, um, and uh, there was uh, like in a forced push, which you don't really have here. I, I'm not going to mention that. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it's a very easy way to uh, basically lose someone else's work, in other words, or lose the fact that they did the work. Okay, so be really careful when you rewrite history, which is what you're doing with something like a squash, um, that you are, you know, kind of doing it without being disingenuous, right? Don't take credit for somebody else's work by squashing out their commits. Does that make sense? All right, uh, this actually happened to a friend of mine wh who worked uh, on a project for like, I want to say like a year or something. And she kind of left the project and went to something else and kind of looked back on it a year or two later. And it's like she never worked on it. Okay. Because there were a lot of changes and all that other stuff, but they just dropped basically all of her commit work, all of her commit tags, all of her logs, just not her code. Right. So she was not happy, to put it mildly. Right. So just it's something to be careful of uh, when you're. When you're dealing with these things, that you know, it seems like you're just kind of tooling along or whatever, but it can be really easy to, uh, you know, kind of remove someone's history by accident. Yeah. If she doesn't work there anymore, why would she not have to? Uh, well, it's an open source project, number one, and she still works at Red Hat. Uh, she just is on a different team. So it was a, but the biggest thing was an open source project. It's not like it was proprietary internal. Um, but even if it was proprietary internal, I would still be annoyed if somebody. And strip my like work and work away. Yeah, you know, be like wiping out what you did. And, yeah. Right. Like, um, and for beginners, I think general rule of thumb: don't squash on branches that multiple people are working on. Um, so it's, it's safe to squash when you're the only one pushing to that branch. But if multiple people are pushing there, um, squashing can result in a lot of pain for people. So don't do it unless you know what you're doing. And even then, you should really, really think about it. Yeah, so hosted services, you know, you have a couple of different options, which we talked about. Um, and this is usually the bit where we ask people to set up GitHub accounts. Um, 
make sure they have Git on their machines. Um, I'm assuming you guys have already done all of that. If you've done your work. Um, yeah, so this is actually something uh, interesting that Harsha showed me. Um, but you can effectively have like a profile page for yourself on GitHub. Um, not very social media, yeah, I know. But again, it's it's an easy way to like um, say you have a link to your GitHub profile on your resume. Um, you can sort of curate what the people who end up at that link see. Um, mm. So you can customize it. You can you know show specific repos. You can link to other things and all that fun stuff. Um, so once you're more familiar with it and you have more experience that is available on GitHub, um, I'd recommend you do that. Again, very valuable uh, resume reference. So I'm from Red Hat. Um, I don't know if you talk much about Red Hat. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> uh, but like, we're very, very big on open source. Right? Um, the idea behind open source is that anyone can, you know, anyone can contribute to it, anyone can use it. Again, with some caveats based on licensing, but you know, principal fit is that anyone can contribute. Um, this is very, very useful again for um, people early in their careers because maintainers and like owners of projects won't turn down contributions if they see that the person making those contributions has, um, you know, they're not coming in with bad intentions, right? Um, so you could be very um, new to a project or to a new language, but if you put your time in, you raise a PR and you raise a, a, a raise a PR there, right? Maintainers will usually engage with you, review your code, and help you improve what you've written. It's an easy way for you to gain mentorship from people you would otherwise never have a chance of working with, um, right? Like on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with people from IBM, NVIDIA, some of from Google communities as well. So it's, you really get exposure to a lot of different um, people and projects. Um, here we have a links to a couple of different um, open source programs. Um, Actoberfest is a fun one. Um, if you contribute to a couple of re uh, repos during that time, uh, assuming that the right tag, they send you free stuff. I think everyone loves free stuff. Um, Google Summer of Code, I think it might be too late to talk about right now, but you know, all open source programs where you can get mentorship and actively engage with companies on this stuff. Um, the last two things I've linked are projects that Harshad and I are working on right now. Feel free to stop by, but you know, no, I won't feel bad if you don't. Uh, one other comment I would make about uh, kind of getting involved in open source projects, you get some mentorship with someone, you start to do some work with that project, and oh, it's backed by some corporation, oh, then they offer you a job. Uh, so it is a very, very good way to get software engineering jobs in particular. Um, however, I actually am, uh, like I know people who have gotten documentation jobs uh, this way as well. Um, you know, obviously most of the people I work with are engineers, right? So I don't know a lot of people who are designers, but they may also get problem slanderers. But the point being is that uh, being very engaged in an open source project, uh, especially if it's corporate backed. Uh, will often lead to a job with that company. Like, I, I know for a couple of interns who were hired just because like they had experience in the project already, which was and full time people actually. So yeah. Yeah, I know a couple of people who were contributing to Kubernetes who uh, had multiple companies fighting over them to hire them, uh, including Google and Red Hat. And I remember Google and Red Hat. I want to say there was somebody else, but I can't remember for sure. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, that's the end of the slides. Um, this is usually the bit where we land on the workshop. We have plenty of time. I don't know how you're going to do it now. So and, and we're you, not going to do the workshop now, but let's ask, are there any other questions about kind of Git usage?